I am Dan Marino in San Francisco. And I'm Nihal Al-Hadi in Toronto. Welcome to The Conversation Weekly. So, Nahal, you have probably seen some of the many headlines recently talking about the moon, our celestial neighbor here in the solar system. Uh, You've been paying attention? Are you a moon fan? Yeah, it's wild. When I was growing up and until now, I love science fiction. It's totally my escapist genre of choice. And the thing with the moon is that it was science fiction that seemed a lot more tangible because as opposed to the rest of it, you can actually see the moon. The moon is always right there. Absolutely. Yeah. I love sci-fi too. And as I've been thinking a lot about we're going back to the moon as a species, what does this mean? How are we going to do it? All those sci-fi stories, well, they all got some conflict. You know, it's not good literature if it's all hunky-dory up in space. Sci-fi deals with issues that are reflective of society. And I think as we expand off Earth into space to the moon, there's a risk that those problems are going to come with us. Yeah, we don't we don't have a good history in general with exploration as humans. So part of me is really cautious about what's going to happen when we start expanding our frontiers beyond our planet. But I'm also really interested as a science and science fiction buff as to the kind of challenges that are posed by this exploration and how we're going to work at achieving them. Well, those two questions, A, how's this going to work? politically, internationally, legally, and also B, how's this going to work scientifically and technologically, are exactly what we are covering today in this episode. So to start us off, I called up Mahesh Anand. Mahesh is a professor of planetary science and exploration at the Open University in the United Kingdom. I'm a geologist by training, and Earth is also a planet, and in fact, much of the information that we have about planets is derived from our own studies from the planet Earth. Uh, But in this case, I left Earth after I finished my PhD, so to speak, and then I uh, landed on the moon. It's all metaphorical, but I was very lucky to be introduced to the fascinating world of lunar science. And given that I'm a geologist, I work with rocks, and those rocks were from Earth. Now I'm working on rocks on the moon, and some of those rocks were those that were collected by the Apollo missions, uh, but also lunar meteorites, which are increasingly becoming available for research. Mm. A lot of times the first question people ask when they hear that the world is going back to the moon is why? And I think hidden beneath that question is the question of, so what is there? And as someone who studies kind of the geology and the materials on the moon, um, in the next couple of years, we're going to have astronauts from the U.S., from China, stepping on the surface of the moon. Can you describe what exactly they'll be stepping on, like on the very top layer? And then uh, if you give us a more holistic view of kind of what's on the moon. The first thing to say is that the moon is our nearest planetary neighbor. So it's kind of our second home. Uh, that is a planetary body that probably most people in the world can easily relate to because they can see up very clearly up in the sky. And that's also another body where we know at least 50 years ago, humans actually landed there, walked on the surface, collected some rocks or whatever they could actually gather in their short stay at the lunar surface back to Earth. And scientists have been busy actually studying those rocks. Actually, in fact, they are all top surface samples this called lunar regolith which is a mixture of finely broken up bits of material whatever was on the lunar surface because there is no atmosphere on the moon so what you have is all the impacts can just come in all the way to the surface where unlike earth where most of the meteorites they burn up high up in our atmosphere and they you know rarely reach the surface whereas on the moon even the smallest of the smallest of the impact you know sometimes even tens of micrometer big, they can even hit the moon at a supersonic, very high velocity and creating a very high energy impact even. Oh, wow. The net effect of all of this is that you have something known as the gardening. So you're constantly churning the top layer, you know, top a meter, top mm. few meters of the lunar surface through these impactors, which are sometimes very small, but of course, occasionally they are quite big in size. For a long time, scientists thought the moon was this barren, churned up, rocky surface with very little that could sustain life in the future. But something changed in 2008. What we realized in the last decade or so is that something that we thought didn't exist 
now we think actually it does exist, and that thing is called water, right? And I think that is what has excited, of course, the scientists like me, because we want to understand what is the origin of that water, how much of that water is there, you know, is that all of the water coming from inside the moon, or is it coming from elsewhere? And if it is coming from elsewhere, then what are the sources, you know, these comets, or these asteroids? Or is it the sun itself, which constantly spews out protons in what is known as solar wind, which are constantly hitting the surface of the moon? So you're constantly depositing those protons. And over billions of years, these protons can actually link up with the oxygen that is present at the lunar surface and convert themselves into hydroxyl molecule, which then gives rise to water molecule. So these are some of the fascinating things for scientists. But why, to answer your question, why everybody <laughs> else is say, interested in going to the I can moon. see why you're excited to go to the moon. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So uh, I think I'm just a you know, poor scientist who is interested in furthering the knowledge about our solar system. We only really discovered the presence of water on the moon within the last decade. Could you talk a little bit about how that discovery was made and what that meant to people like yourself and the scientific community, but then also the broader space community when it was like, oh my gosh, there's water on the moon, because that changes how we think about the world around us a little bit. Sure, sure. And, and I think this is something that we have to break it down into a few bits so that we, we fully understand where this story is started and how it is developing at the moment. It's not yet confirmed that there is definitely water very near to the surface. Yeah? It's not confirmed in the sense that no instrument has actually landed at the lunar surface and touched that water. Yeah? Or, or no sample has been collected from the moon that actually says, oh, actually, look, there is water rise. Now I'm going to bring it back to Earth so that somebody can check how much water is actually in there. So that has not been done. And when I say water or ice, uh, the reason why the water might be in an ice form is because this water deposit is suspected to be present in areas of the moon, which are often, and most of the time, they stay at very, very low temperatures. So we are talking about temperatures as low as negative 200 degrees Celsius. I mean, temperatures that we don't encounter at anywhere on Earth. You know, the extremes of temperatures we encounter on Earth, places like Arctic or Antarctica, and we are still talking about negative 50, negative 60 maybe, right? But I'm talking about negative 200 and even lower. So in those regions, which are under permanent shadow, and that's why they are so low in temperature, the hypothesis is that actually there is a lot of water present as water ice, in these permanently shadowed craters, which are very difficult to reach, difficult to see, in fact, these are so dark that how do you actually see inside those craters? You know, uh, you can't send a robot because mechanically operating something in such low temperature isn't feasible. And if you can't see where you are going, you may encounter other difficulty because you have no idea where you are going. You know, what material sure, you are sure, actually sure. driving on, right? So these are yeah. some of the challenges which are going to be addressed. But before we do that, there are other areas on the moon where, again, there is a tantalizing possibility that there could be some water present in the form of water locked inside the minerals. So this is not water ice, but actually components of water, whether it could be OH, which is called hydroxyl molecule, which if you add many of the hydroxyl together, you form H2O. And these hydroxyl molecules could be locked inside minerals. Right? So they can be present outside these permanent shaded craters. So the question is, are there many types of water on the moon? I mean, this is another exciting progress we are making is there is one type of water which could be present as water ice in the permanently shaded craters. There is another type of water that could be locked inside the minerals that you could actually liberate one day by doing some chemical processing. And then there is another type of water that is produced by solar wind depositing a lot of protons directly into the lunar regolith, where it actually finds oxygen as its friend. And then that hydrogen connects with oxygen and produces water. So we think that all different types of water are present all over the lunar surface. So you might be wondering why we didn't know this stuff 
back in the 60s and 70s when astronauts were actually going to the moon and stepping on the surface and bringing back rocks and samples. Well, one reason is that all of the lunar samples collected by the Apollo astronauts come from the same area, the near side equatorial region, which was the safest place for astronauts to land and is an old lava field. Because they didn't land in these frigid, difficult to reach areas, they didn't bring samples back from them. And then there's also the fact that science and technology have improved a lot in the last 50 years. And in recent years, researchers like Mahesh, who has worked on the Apollo samples, as well as scientists working on more recent lunar samples from China's missions to the moon, have been able to make some very important and interesting discoveries with regard to water. In our lab here at the Open University, we have an instrument called secondary ion mass spectrometer. It's called a mouthful, but in short, it is called SIMS, S-I-M-S. And what it does is that it actually focuses on a very small area of a target mineral, let's say, appetite. And it can actually detect the presence of hydrogen. And not only it detects the presence of hydrogen, it also can determine what is the hydrogen to deuterium ratio is. And deuterium is just another isotope of hydrogen. And it turns out that the deuterium to hydrogen ratio is very characteristic of where that hydrogen might have come from. So if that hydrogen is coming from the sun, deuterium to hydrogen ratio is one or some number. If Pretty that, low, right? Exactly, because there is hardly any deuterium yeah. in the sun. So you're looking at very, yeah. very low D to H ratio, as we call it. Yeah. Whereas if that hydrogen came from a comet, there it contains much more deuterium relative to the deuterium in the solar wind. So the deuterium to hydrogen ratio in the cometary hydrogen is much higher. So in this mineral appetite within a lunar rock, when I'm actually measuring the abundance of hydrogen, how much hydrogen is there, but also its origin effectively, where it might have come from. And lo and behold, I mean, that's where we broke the new ground that from orbit, we were getting signatures that there is water at the lunar surface. <laughs> from the rocks themselves, by reanalyzing the same rocks from, you know, collected 40 years ago, we started showing that actually there was hydrogen present, and that hydrogen could have come from X, Y, and Z sources. So there were more than one source involved. The whole field required a reinvestigation. And that is the, just the science. I mean, we haven't even gone on the other side, which we call exploration. You know, this, this is just science we are talking about. So the question was, what does all these discoveries mean for exploration? You know, why would this scientific discovery of some hydrogen in some mineral in a rock or the hydrated layer at the lunar surface should catalyze the globe in returning to the moon? And the uh, water is where I think the story begins. But it doesn't end there. So in some sense, for space exploration, especially if you want to explore space with humans, water becomes one of the most critical commodity. You know, we need water to survive. But water can also be split into its individual components like oxygen, which we need to breathe. You know, so that way water has become the critical resource for space exploration. And as you know, anything you take from Earth, because of Earth's gravity, it costs a lot of money to actually launch material or the mass from the Earth to anywhere else in the solar system. So if you can actually derive things that you need to survive, but you go locally, you know, it's a field known as in situ resource utilization. So essentially utilizing resources in situ where you are. That's what is actually opening up the field for lunar exploration. Water is, of course, a critical resource for any type of space exploration, but other minerals for construction or electronics or fertilizer are important too. Mahesh made an interesting point when he explained that because the moon is so geologically similar to Earth, it's possible to apply knowledge about how Earth geology works, what minerals associate with what types of rock and geologic formations, on the moon as well. If we know on Earth, what are those rock types where we extract our critical minerals or critical metals and other elements, we could target a similar type of rocks. And if we understand the geological background under which those rocks formed, we might be able to translate our knowledge from terrestrial setting to the lunar setting for extracting those metals, extracting those minerals, not necessarily for bringing it back to Earth, 
In fact, it is unlikely that we will be bringing any of these critical metals back to Earth. But what we would be doing, hopefully, is we would be utilizing these metals and minerals and the lunar regolith itself for furthering the human presence on the moon, therefore reducing the risk to astronauts and also reducing the cost of exploring the solar system and creating a pathway so that humans can start to realistically think that we can one day move towards Mars, you know, because that's a longer term goal. But at the moment, we haven't yet demonstrated that to the nearest object. So Mars is still quite far away. Finding water or hydrogen on the moon is a critical first step for all future space exploration. But the next challenge is figuring out how to access it or extract it. While it may sound easy to just scoop up some minerals off the moon, actually turning this hydrogen into a usable resource is, of course, not quite that simple. On Earth, you would call it beneficiation of ore, which means that if something is not present in enough quantity, you subject it to certain process to actually make it concentrate in one place so that you can then utilize it for your purposes, right? So we started developing those techniques and an idea occurred to me that, look, on Earth, we often do mining for a particular metal or for a particular mineral, and we don't necessarily utilize more than a few percent of what we dig out from the ground because we can afford to. So my question is, if you are not on Earth and if you were actually on the moon, would you do that? Or would you rather say that every watt of energy I'm putting into extracting this material, I want to make sure that 100% of this material is put to some use. That is what is called zero waste or zero sum game and where you have the most efficient use of the resources that are available to you. That is the most responsible way to actually do a mining activity. That is the most environment-friendly way by which you are not actually creating dumps and mine tailings, which subsequently over the years become a health hazard, environmental hazard, you know, landslides and things happen when these mine tailings destabilize. So what I started thinking is that, look, on the moon one day, we would like to harvest some of these critical material, but we cannot afford to throw away 98% of the material. Sure. So we have to utilize that 98% of the material for something. And what that something could be is you need to build your shelter. Yeah. So why not consider using the remaining material for molding your bricks or creating structures, perhaps using 3D printing method, so that you can build shelters for astronauts who would need to survive from this micrometeorite bombardment from cosmic radiations and all that. And, you know, most people don't realize that half of the Earth, half of the moon, any rocky body in the solar system, half is oxygen. So if I give you a kilogram of rock, and if you can extract all the oxygen from it, you suddenly reduced it by 50%. Huh. Because we are not always looking for oxygen because it is so freely available. We never think about extracting oxygen from rocks because it's a very energy-intensive process because oxygen is available as a free molecule in our atmosphere. But on the moon, that is not the case. So what we need to do is to utilize either the lunar water that you would harvest and you would split it into hydrogen and oxygen to create your oxygen. Or if you can come up with a technique of utilizing that 98% of material waste from which you can liberate your oxygen, then you are reducing the waste and the remaining waste can then be put through a 3D printing process to make a structural component. Fear and Wonder is a new climate podcast brought to you by The Conversation, taking you inside the UN's era-defining climate report via the hearts and minds of the scientists who wrote it. It's hosted by me, Dr Joel Gerges. I'm a climate scientist and a lead author for the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And also by me, my name is Michael Green. I'm a journalist and I'm Joel's friend. We're making this show because I realised that I never actually talked to Joel about the nitty gritty of the science and that I actually have no idea how we know what we know about global warming. So I'm going to find out. I can say that it's both terrifying and fascinating to be a climate scientist at this critical moment in history. And the science itself, so how we actually know what we know, is just so interesting. 
that sound you're listening to is lake ice forming at the start of winter in Finland. More on that in the podcast. Listen and subscribe by searching for Fear and Wonder wherever you get your podcasts or on theconversation.com. It's so interesting to imagine how we would use materials on other planets or how we would extract or use oxygen on the moon as opposed to here on Earth. And it makes me think about how all the ways in which we use materials elsewhere can change or shift the ways in which we use materials here on Earth, especially considering the challenges that we're dealing with in terms of managing environmental resources. Absolutely, right? But when we're going to space more so than anywhere else, resources are limited, hard to come by, expensive, they're scarce. And scarcity implies management. How do you decide who gets to use what and how much? Yes, this is a huge question. How do you manage resources and share them between nations, right? If two countries go to the moon, the US, say, and China, who gets the water? How do we decide this? This is a massive open question here. So years ago, I stumbled on the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. And if I had known about that earlier on in my life, I might have made many very, very different career decisions. (laughs) And so I know a little bit about these treaties and discussions and conversations that have come up about managing space-related exploration and resource management. Yeah, the UN and international treaties are exactly where all this stuff is being worked out and debated and discussed. And to understand more about how this is all playing out, I reached out to a space lawyer I know who also happens to sit as a permanent observer to the UN. I'm Michelle Hanlon. I'm a space lawyer. I'm a co-director here at the Center for Air and Space Law at the University of Mississippi. I focus on lunar governance, space resource utilization, and of course, heritage protection. I'm also the president and co-founder of For All Moonkind, which is the only organization in the world that's focused on protecting human cultural heritage in outer space. Last year, I took a class through the University of Mississippi School of Law that Michelle teaches called Astra Politica. In this class, she talks about the foundations of space law, which, yes, it's a thing, space policy, and also the geopolitics of space. And if we're going to be talking about how resources on the moon are used, how nations can collaborate or not in space, understanding what treaties exist to govern how players act in space is really important. And that's where we're going to start in our conversation with Michelle, the foundations of space law. So it's fun to think about space as being the wild, wild west with no rules, right? But it's not. We do have the Outer Space Treaty. It was negotiated in the 50s and 60s. We're in the middle of a Cold War. We've got the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so what were people most concerned about at that point? About war. They didn't want the war on Earth to also extend to space. And so the Outer Space Treaty, the main focus is keeping the peace in space. And so the main provisions say space is for everybody. Nobody can claim any territory in space. It's free for exploration and use by all. The moon and all of the celestial bodies shall be used exclusively for peaceful purposes. We have a rule that says international law applies in space. We have a rule that says you can't put nuclear weapons or weapons of mass destruction in space. Um, And the final rule that sort of limits, if you want to call it that, activity is you will have due regard for the activities of others in space, whatever that means. So that was signed in 1967, and that has kept the peace in space for a long time. It's a fantastic document. A lot of people complain because it's like, well, now, you know, it says we can't own property, but we want to mine. Well, you know what? They weren't thinking about that in the 1960s. They were just wanting to make sure we didn't start putting missiles in space, right? And they did that. So now it's our generation, our time to figure out all of the things that we now can do in space. How are we going to avoid conflict or at least try and avoid potential conflicts with respect to overlapping activities? And so that's where we see ourselves today. The discovery of water on the moon has coincided with this modern resurgence of passion for space from big players like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, but also with national interest from the side of NASA and the US as well as China. And this has made getting to the moon a priority for a lot of people. And this time, the US and China and Europe really have the technology to do a lot more than just collect a few samples, take a photo, and leave. NASA, the US's National Aeronautics and Space Administration, 
has been working on the Artemis program for a while now. The first launch happened last year in 2022. The second Artemis mission is scheduled for November of 2023. And by the end of 2025, NASA hopes to put astronauts back on the surface of the moon. So the Artemis program is part of a larger program. The vision for the United States is the moon is a jumping off point. The whole concept is to look beyond the moon to get to Mars. So the United States isn't thinking we're going to harness the resources on the moon and make the world better. They're thinking we are going to learn a lot about what it's like to live and work in low gravity, and we're going to set our sights on Mars. But this time, NASA is not planning to go to the moon, much less to Mars, alone. The learning from Apollo and the learning through space policy, when the administration, I think it was Obama, turned to asteroids and Mars, we sort of lost collaborators because other countries are like, well, we could help with like a moon mission, but we can't even begin to imagine helping with an asteroid mission or a Mars mission. And what would we be able to contribute to that? So Artemis focuses back on the moon again and very specifically talks about collaboration. We will only succeed if we can do this with as much diversity in geography as possible. And so sort of holding hands out to all nations around the world to say, come join us in this effort to get humans back on the moon. The Artemis program is the technological and exploratory part of what you might consider a two-part plan to help bring the United States and the world at large into this next era of space exploration. The other side of the coin here is much more political. In 2020, the United States introduced the Artemis Accords, a set of international agreements and proposals that are meant to really guide how countries can interact sustainably and peaceably in space. It's not a treaty. It's not a binding document. It's like a multilateral memorandum of, of understanding saying, if you want to join us in our effort to go to the moon and put humans on the moon, then we will all abide by these same guidelines and principles that we've captured in the Artemis Accords. What's kind of laid out in the both the program and the accords here? So the, the program is looking to create a permanent human presence on the moon. We're going to the moon to stay. And so the first concept is using in situ resources, using the stuff that's on the moon to build the stuff we need on the moon. So that's how we'll create sort of permanent habitats and, you know, figure out how to harness solar energy and so forth and so on. And so the Artemis Accords follow in that. And, you know, we have this concept. We already have an outer space treaty, which has two pages of guidelines and principles. The Artemis Accords basically confirm all of those tenets and then start to tease out some of the things we need to think about, like how do you be a good neighbor on the moon, anticipating that it's not just going to be one country. And that's where we start talking a little bit more about things like, well, you can't own property, but if you have stuff on the moon, you want to be able to protect it somehow, or you know, you don't want somebody to come and mine your water. And those are the things that are being sort of teased out and tested now. How many countries have signed the accords? So at this now point? we have twenty-three countries that have signed the Artemis Accords. Okay. Two African countries, several Asian, but it, it's twenty-three, um, pretty widely distributed around the globe, and some are traditional allies of the U.S., others aren't. So that's the Artemis Accords side. This is one group of nations really focused on getting back. But the other side is China, Russia. And China and Russia have announced that they're going to develop a lunar base together. And that is sort of the geopolitical part of it. Well, cosmopolitical, universal political part of it of <laughs> now we have two competing teams headed to the moon. It's about much more than prestige now. It's about understanding where it's the most water on the moon. And so when we talk about a race today, it's not a race to get to the moon, it's a race to get to the best part of the moon. And there's been, I know, a number of other kind of smaller but important treaties regarding space activities. But if we're going to focus on the moon today, who governs the moon? Is What are the processes for resolving disputes, right? Let's say China, the US, we both say, hey, I want to land right there. That's where there's the good water. There's some sunlight most of the year. I'd like to put a moon base there. What's the process for resolving that dispute? Or in have we had any examples of those sorts of disputes yet, or are they brewing right now? So this is why space law is so much fun, because <laughs> there is nothing in place at this point. And it's, that's really what we need to figure out how to do. Right now, if you launch something into space, into orbit, you notify the United Nations through your country, right? We don't have a registry for things that go to the moon at this point. 
but we need one. And there are mechanisms in place. So Article 11 of the Outer Space Treaty says, why don't you tell the UN what you're going to do up there and the UN will record it. And so that's one way maybe of doing it. But you can't go and walk up to the UN and say, I, I'm going to go here. I claim this. Don't, you know, make sure nobody comes too close to me. We don't have that. And we actually have a treaty which makes it impossible to have that because Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty says no state party, no nation may claim territory in outer space by claim of sovereignty or by any other means. If a state, a nation can't own territory in space, how is property divvied up, right? It's divvied up by our government. And so if we don't have a government who has territory, where do you go? So what's kind of the dialogue going on right now? And how do the Artemis Accords, as the U.S. kind of centric stance here, at least to start with, do they address this directly, indirectly, leave it out of discussion? What's the kind of process here? Are we just kind of sidestepping the whole problem? So there's been a sort of slow emergence of a concept called safety zones. And so if you can't own property, then maybe because of Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty, which says you have to have due regard for others, uh, maybe when you set up your installation, due regard means people have to avoid you. Um, and so this is, a, uh, I just want to point out that, you know, we have that Article 2, which says you can't own property, and that's very clear. But then we also have an Article 10, which anticipates that people will have installations on the moon. Um, and so that's a funny dichotomy. So we've got this concept of safety zones. And in the Artemis Accords, there was a whole section sort of explaining what they would do. And they actually characterize them as notification zones. So not saying, hey, if I land here, this is mine and you can't come near. But hey, I'm here. I'm happy to have you come in, but just let me know when you want to come and I'll figure out the best way for you to approach me so you don't ruin my operations. Again, the Artemis Accords have been agreed to by 23 nations, not by Russia or China. Russia in its current state has called the Artemis Accords colonialism, you know, American supremacy at its worst, so forth and so on. China has criticize the accords, not because of any particular reason, except to say all space law should be made at the United Nations. And so the United States, you did this wrong by creating this multilateral agreement outside of the UN system, and therefore we don't approve it. But China has never said we don't agree with your interpretation of Article 2. They haven't said you can't use resources because China has done it itself, right? China's brought moon rocks back and calls them theirs. And they want to build bases just as much as the Americans do. So this concept of the safety zone is one of the things that has sort of percolated up into the forefront of how we're going to look at property in space. And China is the main other player. Obviously, Russia has historically been a very powerful space player, but it seems their power is waning for reasons, obviously, the Ukraine war and the economics and various other things, certainly not discounting Russia here. But would you say... China and the U.S.-led coalition are kind of the two big players here. I would absolutely, uh, let's just put it out there. I, I would absolutely say so. Administrator Nelson has said so, you know, at mm -hmm. the new year, he said, you know, we're in a race with China and we are. There's a group in New Zealand, I think, that um, is opposed to doing anything on the moon, including mining mm -hmm. it. The, the moon should be made a person, you know, personhood for the moon. But I would say on a national level, on a state level, when we're talking about countries that are actually going to the moon. It is very much understood that everyone is going there to, to get access to that water. Mm -hmm. Uh, do regard in these safety zones. So let's dig into this concept because I think this is really the foundation of, I know how you and many other thinkers on this really see the way this process might play out. So let's put an example up there, right? You and I, Michelle, we build a little spacecraft, we fly it to the moon, we land and we start harvesting some ice so that we can grow some tomatoes or whatever. What does this process look like if, say, my neighbor, who also has his own little spacecraft, wants to land it nearby? Like, what are some of the concerns there that do regard might bring up that technologically might be an issue? Dust, I know, is a big problem, potentially. What are the things that might tangibly be an issue? Because this is something that's going to be happening, hopefully, within the next couple of years. It's very easy to think about it rationally, right? And just say, you know, well, if somebody's there, of course, you're not going to go there, right? Because that's what consideration is. That is what due regard is. Just be considerate and understand, oh, there's somebody there. I don't want to disturb them. Um, unfortunately, 
we have to worry about geopolitics, even though it's off Earth. I mean, the moon is often called the eighth continent. And so, you know, geopolitically, I think we sort of encompass it with when we think about geopolitics. And so there's going to be strategic reasons that nations are going to be wanted to be at particular places on the moon. So if we take the states out of it, take the nations out of it, and if it's just you and me. And so you get there first, you found this awesome vein of water ice and you're just like growing tomatoes and you're looking forward to having tourists come so you can sell them your moon tomatoes. And I come along and I'm like, hey, that's a really cool vein of water ice. I think I can tap into it too. Under the Outer Space Treaty, the only thing that we have protecting you and your rights is the concept of due regard. And what does that mean? And we have the International Court of Justice which has looked at due regard and said it's a balancing act. You know, what rights were impinged? How could you have avoided impinging on those rights? And then what are the other alternatives that could have done? So what does that mean? That means that every single time there's a conflict, you got to go to court and do this balancing act. This is the lawyer's cha-ching provision, right? Because I can (laughs) argue balancing acts all day. I can argue for decades. And that is exactly what we don't want. Money going to lawyers like me. We want money going into the technology to make those the best damn tomatoes that anybody's ever eaten, right? So that is what we're dealing with. There's another, an even deeper issue because you and I are American and we have access to this technology. Maybe we're best friends with Elon Musk and I get there and then you get there and we're able to work out our issues and then 50 people follow us and all of a sudden all the good water ice is taken. What about, you know, our counterpart in Ghana or Peru? If space is for everyone and there's freedom of access and use to all, how do we share that or what is the right of somebody who can't get to the moon at this point? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. One of the things that has always fascinated me about space is a little bit of this utopian, it is for everyone. And not only is that kind of some high-minded thing, it's literally built into the foundational documents of space activity. So what do we do here, right? There is discrepancies in technology. The U.S. is going to get to the moon first before Ghana, to use that example here. I guess I'm a little bit worried that it's going to play out just like, you know, for example, Russia is going to point at the U.S. and go, you guys are being colonialists again. Is there a little bit of a grain of truth in that? I'm going to say no, because the concept of colonialism definitely comes from this concept of exploitation. And so Hmm. we do have to worry about our mindset, right? Going to space right now is not solely about exploitation. It's about exploration. And so one of the things that we need to do is really rid ourselves of the exploitative concept of it. And even when you look at the companies that want to mine space resources, they're not doing it to get rich. You know, nobody's getting rich mining space resources for at least a century. I mean, let's just be honest, Hmm. you know, they're doing it because they truly believe humanity should be able to travel beyond our orbit. And a really important tenet of space law is that the benefits of space belong to all of humanity. Personally, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm quite comfortable with the idea of space or its benefits belonging to anyone. I think this is a nuanced point you're getting at here, Nahal. And yes, The tenets of space law say space can belong to no nation. There's no sovereignty allowed. But this idea of benefits and sharing is really kind of tricky here. And there's a lot of people that are arguing right now, hey, yes, the United States, China, all these big, powerful countries are going to space. They're going to be doing things and gaining benefits. But what about other countries, right? Africa has a burgeoning space industry with more than 40 satellites in orbit. India is now launching tons and tons of satellites and doing excellent research, but they're not the leaders here. So the question is, how do these benefits get shared? What does it mean to share, right? Like This is what you're talking about, Nahal. What does it mean to share things that if no one should own them? You keep saying benefits, like there's some kind of universal agreement on what a benefit is is or will be or could be. And, you know, even at a much smaller scale, what benefits one person doesn't necessarily benefit another. Also, a benefit is the result of weighing the risk or the cost and determining that some particular choice comes out better over the rest. So who gets to do that calculation? No, you're exactly right. And right now, it's the US, it's China, it's the most powerful space countries that are putting out their own versions of here are these benefits, here's how we're going to share them. 
and your everyone else is welcome to join in. And to understand a little bit how this works in practicality and see how these benefits are quote unquote shared, we went back to Mahesh because Mahesh originally is from India. He grew up there and now lives in the UK and he studied in the US and he has a really strong connection to this idea of the shared global space industry. And I asked him about it. Every country has its own constraints. Different countries are at different stages of their development, which means that the requirements, the needs of people for a particular country is going to be driven by their socioeconomic status. Now, above all of this, we see all of these countries, whether they are developed, they are developing, they all want to go to the moon, which means that there is a commonality of where everybody wants to go. But that doesn't mean that everybody agrees there is only one way to go there. I recently visited India. The progress that I have seen in the space field is tremendous. The desire to actually build their own launching vehicles, like rockets, and actually become one of the biggest launchers of satellites in the world. They must be applauded for that. And their intention is also to explore the moon in a very similar manner to what NASA is trying to do, what ESA is trying to do, what China is trying to do. But again, their socio-economic drive is very different to any other country that we have talked about. But, you know, there is no doubt that they also want to contribute to the overall global effort. What we are seeing here is we are witnessing a progress of a country where people have aspirations, people have ambitions but not necessarily all the resources compared to many other countries, right? And to me, this is a beautiful example of where if we as humans, if we can actually motivate and inspire another human being, they will make use of whatever resources at their disposal to make a breakthrough. And that's what India has shown. And that's what other countries actually should be taking inspiration from, that they cannot be left behind because people are power. If you can actually fire up people and actually inspire them with a certain goal, they will pull together all the resources and all the effort to make that vision come true. And to me, that's what is happening with India. I have to put my you know cynical journalist hat on here because it's, and this is why space is so fascinating to me, it almost seems too good to be true at times. And of course, space is no perfect anything. But it's interesting to hear you say that such a hopeful note, because I do think like, it sounds you really do believe that the collaborative effort, not only of the developing nations, but also there is a good faith extension of the hand, if you will, from NASA, from ESA, to bring these countries along. Because I, I mean, is that what you see in your day to day? That's what I see. And I can testify to that as a person who has actually benefited from me. Look, I'm here talking to you from the UK. I started my career in India. I came to UK to do my PhD. I went to America to do my first job. That's where I was introduced to lunar science. I came back to UK. I made UK my home. I've been here for the last 18 years. I get all the Apollo samples from NASA. No charge, no questions asked, except am I going to do the best science? So I am one of the biggest beneficiary of 50 years ago when I was not even born. You know, people were going to the moon and collecting rock samples so that I could work on this. I'm so ever thankful for that. And then when I work with the European Space Agency, I don't know who might benefit from it. I don't think about it when I am actually advising the European Space Agency about their strategy. It could be any country in Europe that could benefit from the input that I am providing. When I work with my Chinese colleagues on Chang'e 5 sample, we don't think we are UK-China. We are thinking what we are trying to understand something about the moon. And when I went to India last month, you know, I was surrounded by 100 plus youngsters who were keen, you know, to ask questions and to find out about things. And, and so I have to be hopeful. I have to remain positive because there is no alternative. There is no alternative if we want to actually explore space. And the good thing is space is difficult. Mm. And when you try to do something difficult, you make more friends. That is it for this episode. Thank you so much to the academics we spoke to this week, Michelle Hanlon and Mahesh Anand. You can find us on Twitter at TC underscore audio 
on Instagram at theconversation.com or email us podcast at theconversation.com. If you like what we do, please support our podcast and the conversation more broadly by going to donate.theconversation.com. And if you like the conversation weekly, go check out the conversation's new limited podcast series on climate called Fear and Wonder, as well as our other limited series called Great Mysteries of Physics. This episode of The Conversation Weekly was produced by Katie Flood and me, Dan Marino, and written by Katie Flood. Sound design was by Eloise Stevens, and our theme music is by Nita Sarl. Stephen Kahn is our global executive editor. Alice Mason runs our social media, and Soraya Nandy does our transcripts. Men Marawani is the show's executive producer. And I'm Nihal Al-Hadi. Thank you for listening. Thank you.